The Paul Leslie Hour, helping people tell their stories. And now, your host, Paul Leslie. Hey, it's me. Thanks for joining us, ladies and gentlemen. Bob DePiro is the man who is joining us on this episode of the Paul Leslie Hour. He has been suggested by several past guests, and we've had more than a couple people write in and ask, when are you going to interview Bob DePiro? Well, folks, the time is now. Bob DePiro had his first hit in 1983. He's had more than 1,000 songs cut. He has not stopped an inductee of the Nashville Songwriters Hall of Fame. He is a BMI icon. Many artists have cut his songs. A lot of country artists, and we mean the best, Garth Brooks, George Strait, and then other artists like Bob Seger, even Little Feet, Etta James, a very diverse list of artists. So it's our great honor to welcome singer, songwriter, guitarist, performing and recording artist, Bob, how are you, sir? I'm well, Paul, very well. It's a great honor to have you with us. Well, it's an honor to to be on your uh, on your podcast. I've heard nothing but great stuff about you. <laughs> That's good to hear. Do you think that most people understand the role of songwriters? And what I mean by that is, every now and then you'll encounter someone, and you tell them about a song that they hear on the radio, and they say something like, "Oh, well, I thought that Tim McGraw wrote that." Do you think people understand songwriters? Uh, I think they understand them better than they have in the past. But generally speaking, you know, it's just not on their on their radar. They they want to be entertained. They want to know the song, and I I just don't think they they consider where that song came from. And like you just said, Tim McGraw singing the song they generally, or just not generally, but a lot of the times, they think that Tim wrote the song, or they think that any song George Strait sings, he wrote. And I've run into that a lot, but but I, like I said earlier, I think we're having a tipping point where songwriters are coming to the fore, you know, they're coming, they're becoming more noticed and notable. People are, are showing up in greater numbers at, at songwriter shows where there's not necessarily a, a star, but it's songwriters who've written all these songs that have been parts of uh, the audience's lives. So it's better. I could say that. You've been in Nashville for quite some time now. What do you think about Nashville? What is it like for you living there? Well, it's uh, obviously in the last 10, 12, 15 years, it's gone through a massive change just with the influx of so many things that have caused this town to just explode. You know, I I look back to the point where we got our NFL football team and then we got the Predators and then business just started coming to Nashville like Firestone and and other very big businesses. So it started to become a place to find a job and start a career or start a life. And all of a sudden, the millennials discovered Nashville, Tennessee, and it has just been crazy <laughs> over this last this last bit. You know, so much growth, so many people pouring into Nashville to live. When I first got to Nashville, I chose to live in Nashville not because the country music business was here. I love Nashville. You know, I was, I'm from a small town in northeastern Ohio called Youngstown, Ohio, and Nashville just fit me. You know, it was like, well, I could live here if I was a, a plumber. I love the town. I love everything about it. I always romanticized the South. And it was just an easy fit because I grew up playing rock and roll. I was a rock and roll guitar player playing the rock and roll bands, playing throughout the Midwest. 
I really had no background whatsoever in country music. And when I got here, I just kind of fell in love with the music. And it was, to me, it was like learning a new language. And I wanted to speak the language like a native, a fluent native. So I just kind of dived into it. And, and it's been great, but the city has gone through lots of changes, but I still love, dearly love Nashville. So how do you feel about, as you said, these these youngsters moving to Nashville? Well, I think it's just a natural occurrence. You know, I think not even considering the music, it is just great for the city. Uh, I think it's overwhelmed the uh, infrastructure in Nashville. Can't can't handle this traffic that used to be pretty easy to get around. Now it's like gridlock.com. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. But I think it's a natural occurrence, you know. The young bloods come in and they want a piece of their lives to be involved in music, and I think it's great. Now, it's occurred to me, there's no way that you can answer this question and be humble at the same time. <laughs> Why well, do you, I'll try. <laughs> Why do you think so many people I've interviewed and listeners have requested the Bob DePiro interview? Well, <laughs> you're right. I can't, I can't, I can't answer it humbly or not humbly. I don't know. <laughs> I think the reasons for writers is that if there's one, if there are reasons for my longevity in this business, is that as a writer, I always sought to uh, to make the writing process easy, fun, the, uh, zero pressure. I wanted to always be welcoming to songwriters who I may not have met, may or may not have met, and so. And I'd like to say I've always been very free in my ability to to share what I know. You know, there, someone did that for me when I first got to Nashville. It's a guy named Johnny McRae, who worked at Combine Music, my first publishing company. We were we were diametrically opposed. You know, we were not the same person. But he mentored me. He saw something in me and shared with me so much of, of his knowledge that I just feel like I got to pass it on, you know? So maybe the writers you've talked to are responding to that kind of thing where no matter what, no matter whether we wrote a great song or a crummy song, <laughs> we were going to try and at least have a good time doing it, you know? So I make that part of my writing repertoire and, as far as the general public, well, I don't know. <laughs> I've done I've done a lot of songwriter shows over the years. It's part of my creative makeup. You know, I grew up performing, playing in rock bands, playing all over the place. And so performing is very much a part of who and what I am. And when songwriter shows started you know, rearing their rhyming little heads, I would jump in and I, I ended up playing for a lot of folks. And and maybe that's it. Maybe these folks have seen me over the year, the years, and they've uh, they want to know more about this guy, Bob DePiro. <laughs> One of the things that I did to prepare this for this interview, I did a few things, but I listened to a lot of the songs that you have recorded. Yep. I listened to songs yep. that other people recorded and I have to give right. credit where credit is due. I listened to some interviews that you did in particular, get real with Caroline hobby. Oh yeah. I remember that. It was a good well, interview. Yes, it was. The question that kept popping into my head when I was listening to all this stuff from music to interviews and everything else was yeah. What does this guy, Bob DePiro, listen to? What's in your iPod? What do you listen to when you're driving down the street? Well, that's an interesting question. 
I listen to everything. I mean, I uh, I firmly believe that there are two kinds of music: good music and bad music. And and good music can be found in rock and roll. It can be found in jazz. Can be found in country, and bad music can be found in rock and roll and jazz and country and classical and etc. Now, so I, I my taste kind of big. I mean, I love R and B. I, I love singers. I love singer songwriters. But if I'm listening, I'm listening to rock and roll. I'm listening to. I'm a classic rock kind of guy. I love those songs. I love the fact that there are real instruments playing the songs and the uniqueness of each artist's voice and the energy. I love the energy. And obviously I listen to country music because I make it. (laughs) So I'm in there, you know, and I'm listening to new songs and I'm listening to the radio just to, uh, just to stay current. And, and the fact that I've, there's great songs on the radio, country songs on the radio, and I want to hear them. So I listen all over the place. I do not generally listen to one thing. And I also listen to Howard Stern (laughs) (laughs) because he's just like all over the map and he's he's crazy, but he does great interviews with artists. I mean, his, his interviewing chops are just, great he i remember i didn't know what to think about lady gaga when she first came out but then he had her on the show on his radio program and she just sat there at a piano and played and sang and it was just a stripped down version of that song and it was amazing and he's done that with everybody you know with everybody from billy joel to robert plant to to uh you name it, they've been up there. So I listen to him a lot. And to laugh. I love to laugh, you know. Humor is so important, that's for sure. Oh, man. I have to agree with you. Howard Stern is a fabulous, a fabulous interviewer. You're right there. I, I think he is. I think he he can interview political guests. He can interview musical guests, he can interview actors, actresses, and he's able to just get into it and go deep. And I love that. Something that you just mentioned a moment ago, you said you thought there's two types of songs. There's good songs and there's bad songs. It made me think of something that the late John Loudermilk said to me. I asked him, what's a good song? What? How do you define a good song? And he said, a good song is one that people record. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a pretty good. Uh, that's pretty good. It stayed you know, with uh, me. Yeah. I mean, that's that's as good of a description. You know, <laughs> writers, songwriters. I, I'm always just speaking for myself. I can't speak for anybody else. But you know, we're so immersed in what we do that we lose sight of what it is we're writing. And I had this professor in college who was talking about art, and and he said, the best thing you can do is don't judge your art. Let others judge it for you. Just do the work. And that was, that was like mind-opening for me. It was like, yeah, yeah. So when I write, I'm not second-guessing myself or putting any sort of pressure on me. I'm just doing the work. And with a lot of writers, I'm sure, including John Loudermilk, I'm sure he, he wrote songs or I've written songs that I think, man, this song is going to change the world. And people yawn and they go, what else you got? And then I'll write another song that I'm kind of like, Oh, I don't know about this one. And it becomes the number one song. <laughs> so I, I've just allowed myself just to do the work. And uh, if I go deep, I go deep. If I go shallow, I go shallow. I just, I'm just doing the work and trying to write the best song in the room that day. We listed all of these 
great singers, these great recording artists who have decided to record your songs. Yes. Who blew you away? Now, I know that's probably a tough question, but when you heard their version of your song, who was it that you said, man, he killed it, or wow, she really knocked this one out of the park? Well, at the top of my list is George Strait. I mean, he, to me, epitomizes modern country music. And I'm not talking about millennial country music, but I mean, that era, that phase, uh, I think he was unbeatable. You know, he his delivery is somewhat understated, but he's right on the money with how he, how he delivers lyrics and his his ability to sing the way he does. It, he's He's at the top of my list, and then there, are, there are my there are others. I mean, you know, Tim McGraw, Garth is the greatest communicator I know. He he doesn't sing a song; he communicates a song. I mean, he he makes his audience or anybody's listening pay attention <laughs> with his voice, with his delivery. And then I've got personal favorites like. My buddies Brooks and Dunn, you know, like I love what they do, and I'm so happy they're doing it again. And I just love that version of country that's rocking, rocking country. And that's who Brooks and Dunn is to me. And there's all kinds of people who I love, but I guess those are my those are my favorites. Oh, and I can't forget Reba McIntyre. She, to me, she started my career. That was the first song I ever got recorded was in, was before American Made. It was in 1982. She was a brand, I think it was, it was on her first album. It was a song called I Can See Forever in Your Eyes. And I had written by myself. And, you know, there's this unknown writer. And he wrote the song and he took a chance on this song and, Jerry Kennedy, the producer, took his chance on it. It was my first top 20 hit. And through the years, she's recorded other songs like Till You Love Me and Little Rock and, and other songs. And so, and her voice is just, she's the ever, ever ready bunny. She's the ever ready rabbit, man. She does not wear out. Her voice is so strong and clear. And, you know, it's Reba after about three words, <laughs> you know, she just, she just has that ability just to, this is who I am. This is my personality. I'm going to put it into your song and try and deliver it in the best way I can. Has there been anybody who surprised you? You heard the song and you said, huh, I'm not saying you, you disliked it, but you just thought that is not what I expected. Well, that's an interesting question, too. Uh, well, I'm not going to mention any names, but I've had some people record my songs, and I've gone, oh, no. <laughs> not what I, this is not what I envisioned. But have I had anybody record my songs that I thought, this is the, this is the, the delivery? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, like, um, you know, maybe... I, I wouldn't have expected it being this oh, slow oh. or whatever, you know? Well, that's an interesting question. But for whatever reason, there haven't been that many artists who have, like, recorded my songs who have really changed up the, the energy. And they, you know, with up tempo songs, they might always bump, bump up the tempo a couple couple beats per minute or something, but they usually follow the arrangement of the demo I do because, you know, I, I'm a musician, I'm a guitar player, I'm an, I like to arrange, and so what they hear is the closest version I can get to what I'm trying to put across. And so usually in the records that are recorded, they're pretty pretty close to what they heard. I mean, I'm trying to think of someone played a fast song really slow or or vice versa, but usually they've been pretty much 
following the arrangement and, and the instrumentation of, of what my demo sounded like. One of the songs that we got into a little bit, I yeah. like this song a lot, and I, I can't resist asking you about it. Tacoma, can you tell us about oh. the inspiration? The most popular version, people probably know the Garth Brooks version, but I'm hoping you can tell us about it. Well, that's one of my favorite songs. You know, if I had a top ten, it would most it would most definitely be in the top ten, possibly top five. I don't know. It'd be it's it's one of my most favorite songs that I've ever written, and it was the first songwriting session that I had with Caitlin Smith, who is a great artist in her own right, great performing artist. And I didn't, I didn't know her and I'm, we had never met and it was the first day that we got together. And so it's always a good idea to show up with an idea. So I think it was Caitlin who came up with the idea, you know, she goes, I've always liked this, this, this city's name, Tacoma. And I was going, yeah, yeah, that's, that's interesting. I mean, and I remember us just talking the concept of it back and forth, like, yeah, this could be about somebody that's trying to outrun their past or outrun their, the memories that they have. And they're just going to go across the country until they get to the end of the continent, which is pretty close to Tacoma. And we just grew the song out of that, out of that kind of concept. Uh, I remember singing, "Might make it to Memphis," you know, and that kind of sparked the whole chorus idea, and then the lyrics kind of followed that. But it was a very magical writing session. That's what I mostly remember about it. Once we got on the train, <laughs> so to speak, we just both like were one mind. And it was just like, we were just taking dictation, you know, it was just coming down from the, wherever songs come from. And it's one of my most favorite songs. I mean, obviously Caitlin, if you don't, if no one knows who Kayla Smith is, you need to know her voice is stunning. And it's so good that a guy recorded, <laughs> you know, that, that does a lot that, a, that someone like Garth would hear the power of that song through uh, the fact that uh, a female artist is singing it versus a male artist. And obviously it's, someone sent me a, uh, a recording of Garth singing Tacoma, just him and a guitar in this packed stadium and there you know people got their cell phones lit up and their, their lights and it was just it was just amazing i mean the power you know and and so that's the truth of that song i mean we've gone on to write a lot of songs but but that song is kind of in a in a in a place of honor it is really one of those days that you hope to wake up to sometime as a writer. Well, another one that we have to talk about, it's one of those songs that has just endured. And when you think about John Anderson, inevitably oh. you're going to think about money in the bank. <laughs> so, <laughs> How did that idea come up? It's, it's quite a line. You know, uh, let me think about that. I may have had the, hey, let's write a song called Money in the Bank. Well, what's that about? Well, I don't know. It's uh, Maybe it's about this guy who's dating this girl, and she is, she's all of it. She's the complete package. And she's better, better than money. You know, there's other songs that say, I have a free the birds and bees give me money this is the other side of that like your love is better than money in the bank you know and and we had fun with it obviously it was one of those songs and some of the rock and roll two and four I may have brought to Nashville got 
synthesized along with some just some real country visuals, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and I got to buy me a bass boat and a Z twenty eight. You know, it's you can almost see this guy singing it. And and if you didn't know who John Anderson was, you could just kind of create your own <laughs> character. At least that's what I always got to it. And kids. It turns out, love that song. I bet, yeah. <laughs> I mean, because it's it's deceptively simple and it's fun to your love bed and mine and the bang, yang, yang, yang. <laughs> yep. you know, it's just fun. And then what did he? Say? What I never heard that before. And and so kids have really, as they are got, as they've gotten older, kept it alive and turned other people onto it. So. That was just a flat out good time. We had a great time writing that song. You said you had a great time writing that song, and you also said earlier you said you like to have your writing sessions, no pressure. So, what does it feel like to you when you're writing a song? What's what's the process feel like? Well, personally, I feel I feel very safe. <laughs> if that makes any sense when during the writing session, because I don't know if I'll write a great song today, but I will write a song and, and I know who I am. I know what I'm doing. And, and so I go at it from a positive act. You know, I go at it positively rather than, Oh no, I don't What am I going to do today? I don't have any ideas. And, and all this stuff, I'm like, well, I'm going to do something. <laughs> it may not be great, but I'm going to do it. And and to me, you know, 40 years later, it's still an inspiring process for me that you can go into a room with a blank page or these days, blank computer screen, and come out with something that did not exist about two or three hours ago, or four or five, or however long it took you to write the song. And that's still that's still a mystery to me. And I've, I've said to, I think I said this, that for me, songwriting is is like a Rubik's Cube. You know, there's, there's only several colors in that cube, but I think there's something like 40 trillion combinations within this Rubik's Cube. And to me, that's what songwriting is, is, is you've got these, you know, depending on whatever genre you're writing in, you've got these, these base colors or images or, or lyrics or, or chord changes. But within those basic chord changes, you've got almost an inexhaustible supply of combinations of those things. So that's what it's like to me, and I'm just always looking to, like I said, write the best song that's in that room that day. So it's, it's always, always look forward to writing. Shit, I wouldn't be doing it this long <laughs> if I didn't <laughs> like it. I I know writers who, who, you know, who labor over it, and some of them are not writing anymore or whatever, but. I just, I approach it as a student. I, I, I feel like I'm always learning. On the note of learning, what songwriter that you've written with would you say has taught you the most? Wow, that's a great question. Hmm, let me think about that. Well, very early on, my first publishing company was uh, Combine Music, Chris. Christopherson's musical career started there. And, and there was a guy there by the name of Dennis Lindy. And Dennis is a guy who wrote Burn in Love and Elvis songs and just, an, and he wrote Earl Must Die, you know, <laughs> Dixie Chick song. And, you know, he, he wasn't a schmoozer. He didn't go out to all the bars and he didn't, he didn't hang out and and do the social thing. He he was kept to himself, but he just 
wrote these amazing lyrical ideas and, and musical ideas that were just just really fresh and were coming from a place that nobody else was coming from and just watching him work and listening to the songs he would he would come up with it was just like man nobody's writing like this he he's developed a true voice and that really that really hit me and impacted me big time it was a really I can't understate it. And we only wrote a few times together because he, Dennis mostly wrote solo, uh, which in Nashville is kind of a, an oddity because it's such a co-writer's town. But he would, he would just turn out these things that were so fresh, so cool. And, and so just watching him and working with him, he was the guy. What about these days? Who is your favorite person to write with? Oh man, I've got I've got several. I, I hate not to. I hate to answer this because I'm. Gonna, I know I'll forget somebody, and they'll be pissed at me. But uh, <laughs> Jeffrey Steele and I write a lot, and and over the years we've developed a really really close friendship. So it's more like friends getting together than. Then oh, I'm writing a song today with X or Y, and so I love writing with him. I love writing with David Lee Murphy. He's just so good. There's so many; it's almost impossible to answer that question. <laughs> I always say that I'm I'm musically promiscuous. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I'll just write. You know, hey, you want to write? Come on, let's write. I have been writing a lot with uh, some. <laughs> some of the millennials out there, and and some of them are so excellent. This guy named Justin Ebach, who's just amazing, such a talent, creating the bedrock of the track, and and just under you know he knows, he he knows his way around a song, and uh, and I really dig that. I I like writing with. I have a writer that I've signed. His name is Jason Gant. He, uh, he just had his first number one record. And I like writing with him because once again, he's not coming from where most people are coming from these days. You know, you'll hear people say, Oh, that's new stuff. Just sounds the same. It's the same stuff. Well, I mean, not exactly, but if you're coming from somewhere else, you're more, you're fresher. Your ideas are fresher, and that makes your song stick out. At least, that's what I believe. I mean, I always loved writing with Mark Sanders and John Gerard. That was a great, a great trio we had. Like I said, I can't, I can't even begin to call out the people I enjoy because I enjoy most people, you mm -hmm. know. I just like writing with everybody, you know, Caitlin, Caitlin Smith. I love writing with her. The list goes on and on and on. Craig Wiseman. <laughs> I love writing with Craig because he is a madman. <laughs> he'll just like, he, he'll, he'll like, you think he's checked out. You think he's forgotten about the song you're writing. And he'll be, he'll be mumbling. Word. <laughs> And you'll think, what's she doing? And all of a sudden, he comes in with this amazing lyric that you're going, what? Oh, yeah, I was just about to think of that, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a hard ride because he just kind of goes away, comes back, and goes away. But uh, he's so creative. It's, it's nuts. Well, if we could flip that question over. And it's not okay. just not just limited to Nashville. If you could uh, wave a magic wand and you could write with anybody, anybody, anybody alive, who would you like to okay. write with that you haven't yet? Anybody alive. Wow. Let me see here. I'd like to write with Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> I would love to write a song with him. 
I mean, I just so relate to what he does and and what he's singing about because you know he comes from a born down in a dead man's town, man. You know where he grew up was was not a very prosperous place, and Youngstown, Ohio, was not that prosperous of a place, and there were steel mills there and and Bruce captured that whole thing, and you know, and he rocks. He writes great lyrics, and he rocks. So uh, I'm in. I'm all the way in with that. Golly, there's once again, there's just so many, so much great music out there. <sighs> Let me think. I like to write with John Legend. Oh. I think he. I think he is a, an amazing talent. Not just the fact that he's a, a world-class singer, entertainer, he's got charisma for days, but I just love the songs he writes, the songs that he creates. You know, there's so much feeling in his songs that, uh, man, I would just, I would just like to write with him. And I'd like to write with Casey Musgrave. She is just, I've known Casey for for a good while, you know, before she became Casey Musgrave, you could say. And her her sensibility and her, her grasp of the absurd, but yet the soulfulness and, and her style is just unique. Once again, it's nobody's doing that. You know, nobody is doing what Casey Musgraves has done. It's, it's so unique in its own self and it's so very creative. I mean, I'd love to write with her. Maybe she will get in touch. <laughs> Maybe she will. I might see her during Christmas. I'll have to say, Katie, I want you to listen. I want you to listen to this uh, podcast. I'm talking all about you, Casey. <laughs> I want you to think about when you were inducted into the Nashville Songwriters Hall of Fame for a moment. Yeah. Now there, yeah. You think about all of these songwriters that have made such an impact on our culture. Willie Nelson, Loretta Lynn, Bobby Braddock, all the Bobs, Bob McDill. <laughs> oh, man. And, and then you're among them, the greatest songwriters to write country songs. How does that feel for you to know that, that your songs have made such an impact on people? Well, I mean, at the time, I almost didn't allow myself to think about it because because of the people that you just mentioned, I, I just felt like a songwriter light compared to, to those writers. But obviously, you know, my songs have, have had an impact. They've stood the test of time. I have hoped there's some... some newness and, and freshness in, in some of the songs I've written and, and they're voted by my peers. So it's uh, it's just a great honor, just a great honor. And to be in that, in that little private club is amazing. And so it, I, like I said, at first I just couldn't take it in because it's such a, a big thing for me because I always revered songwriters and and songwriter artists and singers and so to be there with with the some of the names you just mentioned is just hard to believe for me personally but i'm accepting it you know okay i guess i'm that good i, I okay i am that good <laughs> all right now let's go get a beer <laughs> you know it's it, it's just great do you think that it's important to be confident when you're somebody who's pursuing entertainment or the arts? Oh, man. Yes. I mean, I would say yes. And there are different, at least for me, I would think there are, from what I've seen, there are different kinds of confidence. There is that 
just steady confidence that you come in a room and you're sitting down and you're going, well, I don't know, but I'm going to write something today, you know, or some guys are much more vocal about how, just how confident they are, you know, but that works for them. But yeah, I don't know. I don't think you can go into a room and go, I'm going to suck today. I don't know. Or maybe I can't write. Well, chances are you might not be able to, because that's what you've been telling yourself. So yeah, confidence. I remember the first time I met Craig Wiseman. He, you know, just started writing songs and he was like, Hey, what have you, did you like invent the tire or something? Why are you so freaking confident, <laughs> man? And he just had that unshakable belief in himself. You know, that was really impressive before he had any success at all. He had this like un, undeniable confidence in himself and his vision and what he was going to do. You know, it's really something. Maybe you can tell us something that a fan either told you after you were finished performing or. Maybe they emailed you, they found a way to get in touch with you, and they wanted to tell you something. I'm hoping you can tell us maybe a memory you have of something that a fan said that has stayed with you. Well, let me think. There's been some really, there's been some really good moments where that has happened. I wrote a song with Vince Gill called Worlds Apart, and, uh, you know, it was a hit, and I think this one of the vocal event of the year for singing that song. And it was, and at the time, Vince and I were both going through very difficult divorces. And we just so happened, this is the first time we wrote together. We just so happened to have this writing date. And we came in and fairly quickly wrote a song, you know, just up tempo, kind of rocking. And, Nick, Eric Clapton ended up recording it. So we went to lunch and we came back and, uh, you know, we were thinking of maybe hanging it up for the day. And, and I just said, hey, man, I got this idea called Worlds Apart. Like, why do we have to be worlds apart? And, and the song, to me, is like written in three one-act plays, you know, nothing quite as low as this guy turns a gray. You know, you were my best companion. Why, now we lie silently apart. And the second verse is about children. You know, someone's children. The other part is, you know, is when children go away. And the last verse was just about there's nothing quite as ugly as people filled with hate. You know, we'll all end up as equals when we stand in heaven's gate. And that was as personal a song as I think I've ever written. And it was, once again, sometimes these special songs get written very, very fast. And that song got written, I don't know, hour, hour and a half, maybe, maybe less. I can't remember. All I know is we were done with it, and it was like, whoa. And, and it meant something to me, and it meant something to Vince. And just a couple weeks ago, I had, I know, maybe a couple, several days ago, this guy comes up to me and he said, I'm going through a divorce. And I just want to tell you, your song has helped me get, get through this most difficult time of my life, you know? And, and so what do you say to that? You know, it's like, well, thank you. Uh, you know, sometimes songs get out there and you have, they have unintended, con or they have unintended responses, you know, and being able to touch somebody like that is, uh, you know, it's, it's what a songwriter wants to do. At least it's what I want to do. That's huge. It is. It's monumental. What is the best thing about being Bob DePiro? <laughs> Well, my wife, Leslie, says, you know, a lot of people have more fun being Bob DePiro than <laughs> you do, Bob. <laughs> because, I, I, like I said, I, I'm, I'm very generous with what I know and what I have to know and what I have to say. And I guess the 
The best thing about being Bob DePiro is that Bob DePiro is one resilient guy. <laughs> he's lived through a lot of things, and he's still here, and he still has a sense of humor, and he still has an inspiration of life. He still loves to get on stage and play. You know, I guess that's the best thing about being Bob DePiro, <laughs> that after, after all this time, he still likes what he do. He does it. He, he likes himself better every year. You know, it's one of those things. Like Al Anderson wrote a song called "It Right on Time." And the thing is, it took a while to get here, but I'm right on time. And that's that's kind of the story of my life. You know, it took a while to get here, but I, I'm here. That's what counts. So that's. That's the best thing about being Bob DePiro. <laughs> I guess you would say that I'm a survivor. <laughs> Anybody out there, if they want to check out the website, it's bobdepiro.com. D-I-P-I-E-R-O, bobdepiro.com. And I have two final questions. One of them might seem lighthearted, but I really want to know the answer. And that would be okay. this. Where is the best place to grab a bite in Nashville? Oh, that's so hard. <laughs> that is just so hard because, you know, in the last five, ten years, there's a new restaurant that seems to be poking up every week. You know, there's so many restaurants out there and places to eat and different kinds and types of food. I will say this. That being an Italian and being 100% Italian and coming from an Italian family, there is still no single great Italian restaurant in Nashville. At least this Italian thinks that, <laughs> you know, at least I do. You know, I think an interviewer who used to write for the scene said, someone, someone asked about Mexican food and, and she said, well, why do you like this Mexican food over that Mexican food? And the answer was, well, it's it's just not so Mexican. <laughs> it's like, what? You know, I mean, Weird. Nashville is where we voted Olive Garden, the best Italian restaurant, two years in a row. Oh. Now, to a start hearing an Italian, that is heresy. <laughs> <laughs> That's sad. I mean, I get the Olive Garden. I think they do a good job, but you know, it's it doesn't bear a resemblance to what I grew up with. You know, and I'm I'm just hoping for that. They're all they're great Thai restaurants, great Vietnamese restaurants, great sushi places. Of course, it's blended with steakhouses, but they try. You know, there's a couple restaurants out there that are really trying, but you know, compared to any. Italian restaurant you walk into in New York, it's just no competition. Hmm. <laughs> so I'm I'm hoping you're praying for an Italian restaurant. That being said, where do you go to get a bite? Well, I guess I'm old school in respect that I'm a cheeseburger kind of guy. I almost went there today, and that's Brown's Diner. It's this funky little diner that's been there since the dawn of time. <laughs> and it's, uh, thank God, Cheeseburgers and chili and French fries. And they got a bar up front, sort of here, and they got sweet tea. And you know, it always comes out just the way you want it to come out. You know, it's it's a burger, it's a hamburger. <laughs> no, it doesn't have doesn't have foie gras on it, and it doesn't have gold flakes on it, and it's not on a special. You know, vacuum packed brioche bun is a hamburger. <laughs> <laughs> hamburger. And so, if, if I'm looking to get something and I'm in that neighborhood, then I'm going there. I mean, I know it's so wrong for for the health police that are out there, but there it is. I eat my share of uh, sprouts and and the healthy food, but. That's a great place just to grab something. And repeat the name one more time. It's Browns, B-R-O-W-N-S, Browns Diner. And a lot of J. 
just the same people go to the locals. I hope I don't screw this guy up and, and have him invade their place like Hattie B's or something. And well, I guess if you're in a restaurant, that's what you want, you know. But <laughs> Prince's hot chicken has got it over any hot chicken. That's all I can say. And I guess hot chicken originated out of Nashville. And ladies and gentlemen, if you want to eat hot chicken, go to Prince's Hot Chicken, because they're the ones who started the whole thing. (laughs) There you go. The last question I have is very open-ended. We just never know who's listening. Okay. For anyone who's listening, whoever they are, wherever they are, what would you say to the audience? What would I say to the audience? I would say thank you for listening to my songs. Thank you for giving me a career I could only dream about. Thank you for allowing me to do it for as long as I've done it. And for those of you who are out there who might want to try this, who might want a career or a life in the music business, if you have a choice between this and any other thing, any other thing, being a dentist or a bricklayer, do that. Don't do this because this takes every ounce of who you are to, to stand up to all of the, all of the turndowns you're going to get. And that's what you're going to get consistently all the way through. I mean, I'm 40 years in and I still get turndowns, but if you really feel it and you really can see yourself not doing anything else, then go do it for everybody else out there. I'm glad you don't want to be a songwriter. (laughs) I got someone that listened to my song. (laughs) Very interesting. Well, Bob, sir, it was great to talk to you. I'm glad that you came so highly recommended by by these folks. I had fun. Well, I had a great time. This was a wonderful interview. Great questions. Some I've never been asked before. And and like I always say, I am the best in my price range. (laughs) (laughs) What does that mean? I don't know what it means. It makes me laugh. Get them thinking, yeah. So uh, thank you. Thank you for asking me. And uh, thanks to all my friends, my songwriter, and music friends for recommending me. And I'll keep doing it as long as you keep <laughs> listening. All right, Bob. Well, until next time, have a great night. You too, Paul. Thanks a lot. My pleasure. Bye bye. Bye bye. Doodly zing bang booya ducky jap doona cock a boodly ka sabiti punk chi la pak a do zilly bonk a total luck a punk goodbye.